All right, so let's continue with the last of the female. So part of the reason we're spending so much time on female is that there is this whole pregnancy, which is nine months, and then labor and delivery. And then after labor and delivery, then we have to nourish the baby, okay? So human babies are born fairly premature, if you think about other animals in the, in the, in the, in other mammals in the, in the world, right? Um, if you watch a giraffe being born, a giraffe is born and then it's walking within a, a couple hours. A human baby is pretty fragile. So it really needs to be, uh, the baby needs to be nourished and taken care of. So let's talk about breastfeeding and the support of breastfeeding for new moms. Okay, so the body actually starts making milk way before the baby's born. And that first milk is going to be produced for three more days after labor and delivery. And that's called the colostrum, the first milk. So it's actually not even white. It's almost like a light caramel color. And it's, a, it's produced by the mom and has some really good antibodies to help the baby fight diseases. It's really rich in protein. So a teaspoon is enough to help the baby um, feel full for about two hours. Um, and then it's also a laxative to get rid of that baby's first stool that they've been kind of saving up to call meconium. Okay, they have to get rid of this because it can become toxic. There are many benefits of breastfeeding for the baby. You can look at it. It can help stake off diseases, nourish the baby. The milk really matches what the baby needs are. And then there is also a lot of bonding. Okay, and I'll talk about why in just a minute. But also for the mom, most moms will put on um, some pregnancy weight. So breastfeeding, the amount of milk that is produced will help take that stored weight and make milk. So the mom can lose the pregnancy weight. And then as the, uh, as the mom breastfeeds, the u uterus contracts more. And I'll talk about why in just a minute too, to return to pre-pregnancy size. And also formula is not cheap. So um, by breastfeeding, the mom, the family is able to save money on um, formula. Um, breastfeeding does decrease the incidence of pregnancy, but in modern day working environment, it's hard for a woman to have a real schedule and the baby's not with her constantly. So it definitely should not be used as only form of birth control um, because women can get pregnant while breastfeeding. But in back before there was birth control, if you look at a lot of um, genealogy, a lot of kids are born about three three years apart. So the mom is pregnant for a year. She breastfeeds for two. So that's three years. And then she's pregnant again. So a lot of kids were spaced about three years apart, two, three years apart, depending how she, how long she um, breastfeed. So breastfeeding tells the brain that you already have a baby. So that would suppress GnRH. Okay, so you can go draw the pathway if you suppress GnRH. Think about what happened to FSH and what happened to pregnancy and menstruation. If you're breastfeeding exclusively uh, or on a regular schedule, uh, most women actually will not menstruate while they breastfeed. That means they're not ovulating and they are, um, that is uh, what's going on. Okay, um, there is pathways to breastfeeding. It's actually kind of a complicated process. And I like to explain this because when a lot of women worry about low production or their milk is not coming, then um, understanding the pathway can really help them. So I'm going to, here is a complicated um, pathway of everything, but then I drew it out the same way in the stick figure format here. Okay, so you can follow along. And I'll just draw it right here and the next slide so you can. Uh, follow along. Okay, so the pathway for milk production is again the hypothalamus, anterior pituitary, and then the breast. Okay, so you know your brain gets signal that you're you have a baby, and sometimes crying will make it, and sometimes um, a baby's hungry and feeding a lot. That will all be signal coming in. If you have twins, then there's two babies telling the body, make more milk. Um, so that is definitely a situation. Okay. And then that the baby feeding tells the brain to activate milk production. So there's two hormones. One's called 
prolactin releasing hormone. And that's going to be a positive signal on the pituitary gland. And then there's also prolactin inhibitory hormone. Okay, so that's going to be a negative uh, on the on the pituitary gland. So if you're going to make milk, what you're going to have to do is increase the prolactin releasing hormone, but decrease the prolactin inhibitory hormone. So you're going to make milk, not stop milk. And these two, this the higher prolactin releasing hormone is going to release. Uh, another hormone called pro promotion of lactation, lactin, prolactin. So that's a hormone released by the pituitary gland to stimulate the breast. So that prolactin stimulates the breast to make milk. So as the baby feeds more, more PRH is released, more prolactin is released, and more milk is released. As the baby's decreasing feeding, like maybe they're, the baby's going on solids, then the baby will decreasing feeding and then prolactin releasing hormone will decrease and then PIH will increase and then the milk will stop. Okay, so there it's just a teeter-totter how much a baby needs and how much a baby um, is eating and then you have this increased production versus a decrease in production. Milk letdown, meaning let the milk out, is going to be a neuronal process. So hypothalamus, posterior pituitary, the neural hypothesis. So in breastfeeding, the anterior and the posterior are involved. And then we have the breast. Okay, so same thing. When the baby's crying or wanting to feed, the brain gets a signal. Now, in this case, the, there's a neuronal signal coming from the hypothalamus to the posterior pituitary. And then that's going to release the hormone oxytocin. Okay, oxytocin is the same hormone that's released in labor and delivery, but it's released here as well for contraction of the breast um, ducts and the myoepithelial cells and the lactiferous sinus and the ducts to squeeze the milk out. Okay, so the, a lot of people think that the baby is sucking milk out, but it's not, it's a letdown. So it opens up the lactiferous sinus and the myoepithelial cell in the breast squeezes and then there's milk let down and when the baby's done feeding that just stops and then you decrease the let down okay so as the baby keeps on feeding then um more milk is let down okay the hormone oxytocin is the main one that is causing the milk let down and then oxytocin is also the hormone that contracts the uterus. That's an oxytocin when you breastfeed. The oxytocin helps the uterus return back to normal shape. And also um, oxytocin is also a bonding hormone, an emotional hormone, um, a feel-good hormone. So a lot of women then feel bonded to their baby when they're breastfeeding. Okay, so that's a pathway for milk production and milk letdown. One's neuronal, one is not neuronal for the production of milk. Lastly, uh, when the woman's reproductive era is over, then she goes into what's called female climacteric. The hallmark of climacteric is menopause. So we call it menopause, but really it's a long, it's, it could be a few years process when the menstruation stops around age 52. So what happens? Eventually, we will not have enough eggs. Okay, so when the eggs become depleted and gone in the ovaries, those eggs are what's making the hormones, so now they're gone. With all those hormones, estrogen and progesterone levels are going to go down. And without estrogen and progesterone, then the uterus that normally supported by estrogen, the vagina, the breast, all starts atrophying, decreasing growth. So those start shrinking and um, the breast becomes more floppy, right? The vag vagina becomes dry. Even skin, the skin is no longer as supported by estrogen, so the skin becomes dry and less stretchy, okay? Same with the blood vessels. The blood vessels become less stretchy, and that causes an increase in cardiovascular disease and stroke, okay? Um, so it definitely, definitely goes up a lot more during menopause. But there's also symptoms that are related of sleepiness, mood swings, and hot flashes associated with the lack of these hormones. So a lot of women will decide to go on hormone replacement therapy. And hormone replacement therapy 
is going to replace the hormone that the body misses, right? And that's mainly estrogen to keep the vagina less dry, to um, keep the mood less, more stable, to uh, stake off, lower the risk of cardiovascular disease and things like that and help with a lot of the mood swings. But there are risks because estrogen promotes growth and by promoting growth, um, estrogen is going to increase um, the risk of cancer overgrowth. So there's decisions to be made by female how they want to um, handle their menopause and their climactic. So this ends the male-female reproductive system. And uh, if you have any questions, please email me.